we're going to discuss the Persian Empire. Um, so the Persian Empire uh, knocked out the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and they knocked out the Scythians, did they not? Uh, the... Cyrus died against the Scythians. Hmm. Um, th that was a failure, uh, according to Herodotus. Uh, I, I was going to talk about this with the subject of transgression later on. Okay, let's do that. Um, in any case, Persia was the latest and greatest empire in the Near East. It had a landmass area covering the continental United States. So this is no small chunk of land. Um, India to Greece, even Egypt, was reduced to Persian provinces. Um, they were a very multicultural empire, uh, although they had a ruling elite made of Indo-European, Avestan-speaking Persians. They ruled over m numerous linguistic groups and ethnic groups and religious groups under an edict of toleration. Oh, yeah. Um in the Old Testament, uh, Cyrus is called the Messiah. <laughs> That's right. I love that. Yeah, he is. I mean, because he restores the temple. Oh, I know. He uh, was great with uh, collaborating with local elites to uh, maintain peace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so we are jumping into this scene now. Um, Greece essentially made up one to two percent of the size of Persia's empire. So this would be an amazing little factoid when we consider the eventual trajectory of history. So the king of Persia was the Shah, or the Shah Rasha, the king of kings, and he, uh, you know, ruled with an iron fist, as one well, Near Eastern king has to. <laughs> I wouldn't say an iron fist. I mean, he had to, he knew that he had to rule by consent, that to raise an army and stop an upstart would take time. Um, the, the amount of collaboration and diplomacy with ancient and ancient empires was astounding. It, they couldn't rule just by force alone, and... That was the problem with the Ionians, as we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the ways that he maintained his dominance was through the royal road. Yes. Um, now, that's true, but it's also a weakness of the Persian Empire. Um, when uh, Cyrus the Younger, um, when he took a bunch of Greek mercenaries and Persian regulars to uh, overthrow his brother, Artaxerxes, Xenophon, who was writing on it, commented that... Uh, with a sizable force, and with little resistance moving through the empire, a small force could o overcome this massive one if they moved faster than it could mobilize. Hmm. And this road system was a double-edged sword for uh, these sibling rivalries. Yeah, I mean, they could get, I think, a message across the entire empire in you know the span of a week, because they would just have... Relays. Yeah, relays with fresh horses at every stop you would take a rider who would ride from one relay to the next and just get a fresh horse and carry on. Um, that's pretty amazing. Oh. Right, so all of the provinces of Persia uh, were called satrapies. And basically these were um, local elites who ruled over... Uh, well, not local... Well, yeah, in most cases they were local the elites. The satrapies would usually be... a. Uh... Mitch can correct me. The satraps themselves were usually Persian. The thing is, they would be ruling over a collection of local elites. Yeah. So, um, like, um, no, not no, Artaphernes. Artaphernes, yeah. Artaphernes, for example, uh, he would not have ruled over, he would have been in Sardis, but, um, he would have, uh, been ruling under the collaboration of various kings and tyr well, tyrants. Yeah. I mean, look at the example of the Ionian Revolt right away. Yeah. Arist overseeing Arist 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, they had control over the local elites. Yeah, so it was a, quite the uh, well-established hierarchy. Um, hence, there's a reason he calls himself the king of ki a king called himself the king of kings. Right, because he was not just it was, it was not just a superlative. It was the very fact that he was a king over other kings. Right, and and so this is basically how um, their empire existed. 
It was through the collection of taxes at a local level. And this was an extremely popular method of running empire from the time of Persia onward. Persia was really the, the, the first major world empire to extract taxes in this, this way by dominating over local elites and then extracting taxes through them. Um, and then the, the Romans would pick this up later and the Ottomans would have it and all. Yeah, the Greeks did it after the Persians. Yeah, well, the, the Greeks did it well, during the Persians too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and and we could say that the the Greek world was ultimately peripheral to the Persian. Oh world. yeah, the, the Greek world, you know, as great and large as it is in our minds, was was like I said, one to two percent of of Persia's size. I think uh, you're might be understating the value of the Ionian coast. Though. Oh, of course. The Greek-speaking world extended well beyond mainland Greece. After the era of colonization, there was an extensive populating of the western coast of Turkey. So most of western Turkey was Greek-speaking um, from a fairly early period. Relatively, I guess. Relatively is always <laughs> understood. <laughs> understood. That goes without saying here. I'll use uh, the game. Yeah. Um, but they played a major role in, in bringing Greece and Persia into conflict with one another because they were the yeah. area of contention um, where the two borders mixed. So they, the, the Ionian, the city of I, or Miletus, yeah. Of yeah, Miletus, Miletus. Um, on the Ionian coast. <laughs> Revolted in the year 490 BC. 499. 499. 499 to 493 was the Ionian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that, Mitch? Uh, so there was a plan in place. Uh, Aristagoras, mm -hmm. the tyrant of Miletus, under under the Persian satrapies, uh, came up with a plan with Artaphernes, the satrap, to invade the island of Naxos and take it over. Uh, it went very poorly. And, uh, there are some as conspiracy many, theories yeah. involved. Conspiracy theories. Uh, like many island um, invasions to come. <laughs> yes. uh, but the result was basically that uh, Aristagoras felt that his position was precarious. Well, uh, a good thing to... Yeah. <laughs> he tyrant, he, yeah. he promised booty to Ar Artaphernes, and now he came back, no, not only um, with nothing, but owing a lot to the Persians in power, and feeling like he was to be replaced. So if this gets reframed in a Mel Gibson style Braveheart, <laughs> it will probably be under the banner of freedom that they revolt. Um, yeah. It was really just one tyrant not wanting to pay his debts or lose his status. Yes, <laughs> freedom of the Greeks. And the Ionians did have a very strong tie with uh, the Greek mainland, especially yeah. the I Ionian Greeks. Right, and that they was a whole Phoenix. system yeah. for a long period. And they were never long. that happy with the uh, Persian rule. Um, when when the Persians. Uh, attacked the Lydians earlier, the Ionians refused to defect. When the Lydians were conquered, the Ionians were under the Lydians at this point, the uh, Greeks had to be conquered piecemeal, and then um, it was hard for the Persians to establish that local rule of uh, the elite with the constitutional, constitutional system of the Ionians being so public. Mm -hmm. So they were a constant thorn in the side for the Persians from before their incorporation into the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. So what we end up with is uh, Aristagoras turning around and deciding to revolt and catching a lot of the Ionian colonies in his revolt, um, which isn't going too well because you have the entire Persian nation against the small coast of Turkey. Uh, so they call to the mainland for help, uh, mainland Greece, and two states respond, Athens and Eretria. So uh, so now we have the Athenians and the Eretrians on the Ionian coast fighting for Miletus and the, the freedom of the Greeks. Uh, but it doesn't really... Taxes. <laughs> yeah, taxes, money. Uh, they get money from the Ionians. Um, but uh, like that's how it always pops up, right? You have the Greeks fighting for other Greeks under the guise of freedom of the Greeks to control the other Greeks. Yeah. Um, 
but in the end, none of this goes well. Uh, the revolt's lost. They do burn Sardis. They do the, burn Sardis. The satrap, the uh, seat of the satrap. Satrap, yeah. But uh, the end result of the war is that Miletus is besieged, taken, and everybody's sold into slavery. Um, but common uh, practice. Common Before practice. Before you think it sounds cruel, this was yeah. this was standard. Um, they had the same if later the, on in the war. They have the same. The Athenians and Pompeius the same on the yeah. Samelian dialogue. Yeah, yeah. we've. We've talked but, about that yeah, at length yeah, in previous... But, uh, yeah. Yeah, selling them to slavery. So. If, if, the, if the, the second the ram reaches the gate, if you haven't surrendered, there's the conditions for surrender have just gotten far steeper. Yes. And if they breach the wall and you want to negotiate then, for the most part it is... Um, it's going to be a very, very, very high hostage <laughs> count. Yeah, at the end of the revolt, you end up with a reconquered Ionian coast uh, and a mad king. Um, Persians don't forget too quickly that the Athenians were involved in this revolt. Right, he hires like a cupbearer to (laughs) remind him at every meal and whisper in his ear. Yeah, (laughs) remember. (laughs) From Herodotus, the Ionian, um, born actually right before the finish of the Persian Wars. In 484, I believe, is Herodotus' birth from Halicarnassus. So, yeah. um, oh, it's an uh, interesting story too. Um, when it comes to a little bit of source criticism, uh, when the uh, Miletians eventually uh, agree to surrender and all that, when during the siege, they send Heraclitus, and he was one of the only people when Aristagoras wanted to uh, revolt who kept arguing against it, so they send him, and he tries to excuse his populace and all that. And, um, it's just funny, because, of course, he comes off good. He's an earlier historian who Herodotus definitely used. Yeah. And, of course, he's going to say that, oh, I was against this the entire time. That's what historians write about people yeah. doing this, despite the fact they incited the populace what just a few years the... earlier. Heraclitus's field specifically was, he was the study a, of people. I forget what it's called. It's, it's slipping my mind. It's, he was a skeptic. I know that. Um, Are we talking about the Heraclitus, the, the weeping philosopher? This story. Everything flows. Oh, the historian Heraclitus. He did. He did studies on peoples, which was. Do you mean Hecateus? Ethnography. Oh, yeah, maybe Hecateus. Yeah. Hecateus of yeah. Miletus Hecateus. is a logographer. Hecateus. Yeah. 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 Who did I say? Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Yeah, Heraclitus yeah, is the sorry. philosopher. Yeah. philosopher. Yeah. 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 Sorry, that's I knew. Damn Greek names. Yeah. Of course. So you have Hecateus, who did study. Lo- he's a logographer. He did studies on peoples, and late, which is something that Herodotus himself yeah. picked up a lot. And really Book built two on. of. Herodotus yeah. is a basically an attempt at a Hecateus style. Yeah, it was thing. one of his major interests. I think that's probably the majority of Herodotus's history is about is just studies of peoples and yeah. things that happen to local populations rather than on like a single uh, like a monograph like yeah like yeah, a giant cities, Trojan right. War yeah right right. So um, what next? Well, we have angry Darius, Darius the first, uh, sitting in Persia. Wanting revenge, um, he conquers Thrace. Uh, his um, son-in-law Mardonius, who's the general that pops up through the rest of the Persian Wars, uh, has him conquer Thrace. Um, yeah, they go right up to the Danube River. Yeah, yeah, and they also uh, start to move towards Greece a bit as well. Uh, his fleet is crashed around Mount Athos. Uh, Cherenesis, I think, is uh, where that is. far co- more common um, disaster than we think today. Yeah, and uh, uh, it doesn't pan out too well immediately for him, but he comes back to Asia uh, injured, uh, and this is sort of the planning for the invasion starts. Uh, Darius starts by sending messengers to all the Greek cities for uh, the traditional demand of earth and water. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Darius knew Athens had helped and yeah, wanted to teach them a lesson. Probably more formal, but they did go to Athens and Sparta, and I think uh, they're the only two cities recorded that refused the messengers, um, which prompted the invasion. I know Brett wants to tell the story of Queen Gorgo, so I'll let him go. Well, who was the, her father at the time? The king? The one of the two kings? Gorgo? Her, yeah, her, her father, uh, Cleombrotus? Cleombrotus? Maybe. 
Uh, it's been a while since I've had my start in Kingstown Pat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it could be Cleombrotus. I just remember that the, uh, the, the, Spart- the Persian uh, envoy was trying to uh, buy the favor of the... It, I see, uh, all the Persian kings have the same name, so I don't know if it's an Agias or a Cleombrotus or... Uh, I, it was probably a Eurypontid king, because it wouldn't have made sense for Leonidas to marry uh, Agiad king, or queen, king's daughter... Yeah, um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> name's not important, it's some guy who's forgotten almost anyway, but he, the Persian was trying to buy his favor, and she just, Herodotus recalls that she told her father, Father, this man's trying to corrupt you, because this is just, throughout his history, his astonishment with Spartan culture, it's very simple, um... And a woman was a, a young woman was allowed to speak out of turn in front of an envoy. Just caught him off so off guard. <laughs> oh, so yeah, what you have is uh, after that, back in Persia, Darius uh, begins to plan his expedition, uh, and he sends the force out towards Euboea. Uh, they end up starting southern Turkey, I believe, going towards Rhodes and across the Aegean, uh, stopping at a few places. Uh, they land on Euboea. Eretria vigilates right away, I believe. Uh, and then they sail south and land at Marathon. Mm. Uh, and this is where we get the first major Athenian involvement. Um, you get the story of Pheidippides running back and forth uh, to Sparta, trying to get the Spartans to help them. And the Spartans, of course, show up after the battle. One of the more famous things. Uh, can't, yeah. Can't do the religious ritual days. Yeah. Sorry, you're on your own. It seems to be the case with every story that involves Sparta. Yeah, no, we have a religious holidays. celebration, or the slaves are revolting. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love Three Hundred, the for three uh, for freedom and all that. Yeah, Keep up free Greece. Yeah, good <laughs> American flavored freedom. Yeah, they have how, they have a greater slave population of Greeks <laughs> than they have their own population. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, the Athenians are stuck on their own. I, I do believe there are more than just Athenians at the Battle of Marathon. Um, Plateans? Plateans. There might have been Plateans at Marathon. But the Persians land at Marathon basically in a swamp. Uh, Marathon's on the east side of uh, Attica. And they kind of lay their ships up in a swamp and the Athenians decide the best thing to do is to kind of rush at them and not give them a chance to recover from getting off the boats and having sailed. Uh, so the Athenians rush in with everything they have um, and end up actually driving back the much, much larger Persian force. Yeah, and they were hoplites. Yeah, the hoplite warfare with... Uh, have you heard Bob Porter's approach to this battle? Uh, I probably have. <laughs> um, he, Bob Porter, the military historian, he loves to talk about this battle because he, the way he sees it, just given that they were short on people and all this other stuff, the Athenians won with a double envelopment maneuver. He thinks this was just pure chance that they managed to clumsily move their way into this. And he he's a huge opponent of the idea of how organized the early hoplite yeah. line was. Mm. So he thinks yeah. that this is still the trial and error phase of warfare, and that the double envelopment maneuver that allowed both wings to just encircle the uh, Persians was just simply because they needed to... Uh, just get as uh, as wide a wing as possible. Yeah, well, you have to remember, too, that we've already been looking at hoplite warfare since about 669. Yeah. Uh, the Ar- in the Argolid was where it basically started. Um, so it's been a while. I, like, I, I can't say for sure whether or not it was luck. I mean, it's it's not like Sarissa style Alexander. No, like, no, no. It's, no, it's, uh, it, it's probably looser, but I mean, they had to have some sense. It's still and, a moving wall. And you have to think it's funny, too, because this hoplite army is going against the Persian army, which would use much different tactics. But, I mean, that was probably the idea. They rushed the beachhead. They can't... There's um, nowhere to move back. Nowhere, nowhere to, to move, move back. back. Yeah. You have forces in the water stuck in a swamp that isn't going to help you at all. Um, everyone's I, moving slowly. Everyone's now. moving slowly. <laughs> yeah, and it's heavy armor uh, on, the, on the Greek side. Yeah. But, but deeper water is on the Persian yeah, side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, 
they're driven back. I mean, Herodotus records 6,400, 6,500 Persian casualties and about 192 Athenian casualties. Yeah. That's um, not an unusual number. Um, no. But, if but you can Herodotus rev- is a master of no, exaggeration. No, um, there are more <laughs> r- ridiculous numbers for, um, like, Sola's troops going against Mithridates, where there'd be a, only, like, a single digit of Roman dead. Yeah. Um, if you can rout at the initial charge and not sustain heavy casualties, you, you, you're you looking at, like, under 100 versus tens of thousands. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, like, the idea of, like, the Braveheart battle where they clash sides and just smack at each other with sharp things until the one side's completely dead. Yeah. That's, you know, that's not how it happens. <laughs> yeah, one has to break first. Yeah, if you can, then... And that was the Roman approach. Try to break on the initial charge. You kill one line, the next line starts getting chopped up. And the third line and everyone else just sees what's coming for them, and they turn and abandon their friends in front of them. And all of a sudden, they get picked up by the cavalry. Yeah. Who probably or probably are a rival faction at home who provided horses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have no reason to let survivors get out. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I think I think modern historians have rated the casualties higher on both sides, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. But in any way, yeah. it's it's a humiliating yeah. defeat. It's it's a big, very stark difference between Athenian loss and Persian loss. Um, and like, I don't think we mentioned the commanders yet. You have Miltiades, the Athenian leader, uh, famous Miltiades, who, even though he did many other things, his gravestone said uh, Marathon of Machoi. I thought, uh, I thought at Marathon. Same with Sophocles. Yeah, it was it was a bigger deal. Was he Marathon or? Um, he would. Sophocles, uh... Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, it probably would have been... Plataea, maybe. Oh, it might have been Plataea. Marathon... Sophocles was writing in the 20s. 420s, I believe. Maybe it was... Just it was, uh... Later. Uh, or Aeschylus. Yeah. Aeschylus. He was... Uh, that, he yeah, was yeah, the yeah. second Aeschylus, person. Aeschylus, yeah. Was it was Aeschylus. It was Aeschylus. He was at Plataea, though, know, wasn't he? Um, he wrote all sorts of... There was a playwright that had that on his grave instead of like all the awards he yeah. won in a uh, festival for Dionysus. It's one of those two. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I it's, fought it's at... It's Aeschylus. He was in the Persian Yeah, world. I yeah. fought at Marathon is all that mattered to him. Yeah. Um, which lasted a long time. Like, that was a big thing in Athenian sight for a long time. They were so proud of this victory that was decidedly Athenian with no help from the only persons they asked for, the Spartans, who showed up immediately after, marched up and I always think it's funny, too, with Pheidippides, as the story goes, he ran, smarter than back, and then he ran Happens a marathon, fought, and dropped dead at the end because he was so tired. Um, yeah, the 42-kilometer yeah, run back. Yeah, the... <laughs> 26 miles, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, on the Persian side, you have Datus and Artaphernes, the son of the satrap Artaphernes from um, the revolt, the Ionian revolt. Uh, who obviously didn't do so well. So it all goes back to Darius again, obviously unhappy that an invasion of Athens has been spoiled and his revenge has to be put off, uh, at which point he has to go back to the drawing board and start planning an even bigger campaign for the future. So you have the Persians preparing and preparing, uh, building resources, conscripting, uh, getting their armies ready because uh, they're looking at a more... Fuller invasion. Yeah, and Darius land. dies. Yeah, he's assassinated. Yeah. Uh, there's civil wars. No, he gets sick. I think uh, there's a revolt in Egypt uh, in 486, uh, at which point they have to set that down. Uh, but oh yeah, he does. He dies uh, trying to pick up the revolt in Egypt and put it back into place. Uh, at which point his plans have been delayed because of this revolt. Uh, they're trying to set the empire that they already have back in order. Uh, and Xerxes the first comes to the throne upon the death of his father. Uh, so Demaratus was the Spartan king, uh, and then he defected to Sparta or to uh, Persia. Sorry, and he was uh, the advisor, Xerxes' advisor. Okay. Oh yeah, that's he was the traitor king. Okay, but not but not Gorgons. Yeah, Goro, Father Cleomenes. I was right. <laughs> so they were related. No. That's, cousin that's marriage strange. Cousin marriage has only been a, just uh, like a bad be. thing for a few hundred years now. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was I mean the Catholic Church invented that concept. Yeah. 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 Not that I <laughs> And <laughs> some Protestants decided, you know, cousin marriage. 
<laughs> and some were like, no, the Catholics got this right. Um, which means they are actually true believers of this cause, because you don't just concede something to Catholicism. <laughs> Protestants are still pretty Catholic. I mean, they oh, have yeah. the same Bible. Oh, they got rid of, some got rid of the Apocrypha, some put it at the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the difference. <laughs> so, like, if you want to read, like, the book of, you know, Judith, you best not be getting, like, a Baptist Bible. Go Anglican. <laughs> Anglicans have good, uh, they've got Anglican. good masses and stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they, they have, like, the decorum of the Catholics, but the, the freedom of the, uh, Protestants. Yeah, it's just, the whole thing about national religions just weirds me out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it could be an ethnic religion. <laughs> <laughs> it could, and it is. Oh, I guess that's national. We're just in it. <laughs> Ethnos and natio, you know, yeah. that's, <laughs> Gens. <laughs> A Gentile religion is different. <laughs> yes. Are so, we recording? Yeah, we are. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. So, um, Athens strikes it rich. Yeah, Athens They find a silver mine. Finds uh, a new vein in the Laurian mine, actually. Uh, the oh. Laurian mine is founded by, or found by the Pisistratids during okay. their reign. Uh, that's how Pisistratus was able to fund himself. Uh, but they found a rich vein, and they had to decide what to do with all this silver that they've just gotten. Uh, and, of course, the answer is war. Get more. <laughs> get more, yeah. Get more silver. Uh, so, at the time, one of the leading statesmen is obviously Themistocles, uh, one of the great generals, uh, someone who would be well, known almost entirely. For He's the, the one war. with the really outstanding abs. In yeah, the yeah, in that movie, the, the great abs and the... Uh, Does he actually have that of violent of sex in real life? I believe so. Because it, for being as violent as it was, it still looked very bland. It's not in the record, but we can only assume he was a bit of a sadist. All right. Um, that movie just blew my mind. Oh, yeah. Not it, in a good way. Yeah, um... The only thing it sunk in that naval battle was my expectations. <laughs> I think, I think though that the movies three hundred and the second one, which admittedly is less, I like the first one. The first a lot. one's great. One oh, of my favorite movies, pacing, hands down. Horrible pacing. One of my favorite sure, movies, hands down. But it's great. It's fun. But oh, no, it's you have to look at boring. both of these movies like you look at Herodotus. It's an exaggeration of the truth told by the victor. That's why you get these disgusting, like. Oh no! The Herodotus guys. told a good story. I don't have anything. Oh, wrong. those movies are super racist. Yeah, no, they no. Are, but it's completely biased towards the victors because you have to imagine, like the first story, for example, the better example, obviously, too. You have uh, the Spartan uh, who tells the story. He's the narrator of the movie. He's telling it from the viewpoint of a Greek who sees these disgusting Persians uh, with this huge army invading, doing these like lurid, decrepit things, and. Uh, and they're just appalled, and this is why the Greeks are the greatest. We have the greatest abs. We run in there and we fucking chop them up to death, like no problem, because they're these weak ass Easterners. I I do not have any problem with the historical inaccuracies of the movie. I hate it on technical grounds because I think it's poor cinematography uh, <laughs> and bad writing. I am not going to say it's the best. Ever. I, hate I don't the think whole it's the best. I hate Zack Snyder to it. That's uh, I, I, I would. Yeah. I, that's a story. And then the like though. hardcore <laughs> Orientalism. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, they have turbans and like yeah, and like black guys like sinking into the darkness and like turning pitch black, yeah. and I'm just like. Whoa! <laughs> that and um, Herodotus was far more critical of the uh, Greeks as well. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not based on Herodotus. It's no, based no. on a comic. It's it's just that. But anyways, the second one, the second the one was, was awful. And yeah, I mean, he was about forty years too young. I did like those nice S and M straps. That yeah. should have clued me into that the, was um, the best part. The pointless leather straps. What that should have clued up? me into the violent sex. Scene it's like part. a lifting belt. It's just to hold their muscles in place. Mm. <laughs> it's just to keep those pecs tight. <laughs> it really threatens your opponent when they see such chiseled bones. Ooh, is that a push-up strap? <laughs> yeah, well, yes, they're all the brave. It lifts and, and separates. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the best part. I actually... So uh, tell me about the real Themistocles, at least the real one in your brain. Themistocles was an old statesman. <laughs> Very nice. Themistocles was... What about the one in your brain? <laughs> uh, the one in my brain, um... 
feels that Mitch can give him a better shakedown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Themistocles was an old statesman, uh, had fought at Marathon. Um, he he was not young, contrary to what the movie would have you believe. He was graying. Um, so he had those old man muscles. Yeah, old man muscles. Oh, dad strength. They were... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He, he, he couldn't um, play, play like Arnie or something. Man. But yeah. uh, he he was make firmly behind movies. Athens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not my mate. <laughs> I can be. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, so Themistocles wanted a navy. Uh, the famous prophecy from this time is uh, how do they defeat the Persians? Because they know the Persians are coming. Um... And the answer is to hide behind your wooden walls. Yeah. Uh, so in these. Well, this is an answer given to him by, by the Oracle. By the Oracle Delphi. Delphi. Yeah, they sent away. What do we do? So the Athenians had a debate uh, as to what to do with this money. Some believe literal walls were the answer. Uh, Themistocles took so it. Two hundred warships. Two hundred warships. Metaphorically, the walls of wood that would make the hull of the boats. Uh, so that's what they did. Themistocles, in the end, convinced the Athenians to build a fleet, uh, which gave rise to the Athenian thalassocracy that would follow uh, for the next hundred or so years. Right. Would um, you mark this moment as the birth of the Athenian Empire? or I would work? say it's definitely leading to it, if not where they gain the tools that they need. They make the decision that we need sea power. Uh, and it kind of carries through where they have, we have this sea power now. Yeah. How do we extend it? How do we make our income bigger? How do we gain more territory? Well, I mean, sitting on the Aegean, you have all these islands, so you collect from the smaller states. Uh, yep. and, and the thing, too, was that at the time, the Athenians had no rival in size for uh, what they were doing. Like, the Spartans, certainly, as their main rival, historically, as we see it anyway, were not sailors at all. They were land-based troops, uh very small elite class that only got smaller as time went and on. And they phased out because of it. And as, yeah, absolutely. And and the other advantage the Athenians got out of a rowing fleet was that they were able to employ uh, the, the poorer people of the city who couldn't afford hoplite armor, who couldn't fight in a battle formation. They put them in the seat of the ships and paid them. Oh, very interesting. So uh, It was a free citizen body. Free citizen body. So they had a higher citizen participation and they weren't using current land troops to fuel their naval fleet. So they all were jacked. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they would have been. Or they would have had my shoulders. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So so they started to build this fleet uh, around 44-ish as well, uh, slightly after the death of Darius in Egypt. Uh, and they're preparing. Um, so now, back in Persia, that uh, Xerxes on the reins, uh, he's continued his father's plan relentlessly. He, he doesn't like Greece. He's ready to take them over, make them pay for all the injustices they've done to his country. Uh, so he he readies his campaign. Uh, around 482, he finally starts to muster the troops to gather them uh, and march them towards uh, the Hellespont, where he decided it would be best to move his land army. He also sent a fleet, uh, an advanced fleet, across the Aegean. Uh, The Persians used Phoenician naval ships, big lumbering things, which would come in much more important later, the Battle of Salamis, uh, when they had to go against the Triremes. Mm -hmm. But uh, back to their army, uh, up through Turkey... They get to the Hellespont, and they have to bridge the Hellespont, so they build a pontoon bridge, two, uh, dual pontoon bridges, which fails the first time. Yeah, this is the uh, scene I love this where scene. The Xerxes and his, uh, all his hubris being whips the Pontus River. The God King. Yeah, um, for being... Insolence. Yeah, an insolent river. Damn you, river! I, I mean, you can't argue with the results. You got the bridge across the second time. Well, so. that's, the, Herod, <laughs> this is all part of Herodotus, yeah. though. He, he likes to do, like demarcate uh, boundaries where, within which people should stay, and he considered um, both the Athenian expansion into Ionia, uh, various empires and kingdoms growing outside of their natural boundaries as an act of hubris. hubris. Yeah, so, I mean, liminality is like a massively important So concept. in the ninth book, when he talks about how this, what you call it, point is the furthest west the Persians get, he's mm-hmm. just talking about how much they've exceeded beyond their natural limits. Yeah, so 
but obviously one of the better stories. I, I think it goes kind of towards Xerxes as well, kind of megalomaniac, better than, you know, the god of whatever spirit is in charge of the Hellespont. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, he builds this pontoon bridge out of all his boats uh, and puts the wood across them, uh, has the army march across. And uh, one of the second interesting things that I think comes out of this is uh, the channel across the peninsula with Mount Athos. Because they had lost the fleet with Mardonius back uh, in the 490s, so instead of trying to sail around and crash the fleet, they dug right through it and built a channel. Uh, an insane engineering feat. Um, That's awesome. Uh, and it's just it shows you how, how well the Persians would adapt and how resourceful they were. We'll get to um, that at 300. I want to... <laughs> well... The year 300 or the movie 300? The movie 300. <laughs> uh, Thermopylae. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, my favorite. Uh, so now we have uh, this Persian army coming, and uh, the Greeks panicking a little. Not too much. Are we going to talk about Medizing? Because I love the idea of Medizing. We'll get to Medizing. Yeah, I, I do like the first, idea uh, of Medizing. Alexander of Macedon. Alexander the First, uh, two prior to the Great, sitting up in Macedon. So the original plan by the Greeks was to fortify a pass at the Vale of Tempe. Uh, which is just south of Macedon, above Thessaly. Uh, however, uh, Alexander I of Macedon kind of betrayed the Greeks of the south by telling the Persians exactly how to get around this pass and into Greece, uh, so that that defense had to be abandoned and they had to pull back. And right away, obviously, you want to talk about Medizing Alexander of Macedon. Um, well, yeah, he he could be considered to Medize. Well, again, the Greeks never considered him Greek. What Medizing is? Medi well, I mean, it's okay. So the Greeks called the Persians the Medes after a yeah a after a tribe in the north that the Persians themselves conquered. At, yes, at, the original empire was the Median Empire. Yeah, the Medes helped to tear apart ba the um, Babylonian Empire and the Parsi section of the Median Empire revolted, met Cyrus the Great. Uh, and took over the Medes and eventually built his empire on top of that. Um, right. So to meet us is essentially... To betray one side or to switch loyalties to the Persians. Yeah. So so we have Alexander, uh, who gave the Persians a way around the Vale of Tempe. Uh, we have um, Thessaly and Thebes. Thebes. Now, uh, I like this one because Thebes is always kind of given a hard time for betraying the Greek cause. <laughs> However, the Greek the cause... The Greeks abandoned Thebes, so... Yeah, at first, the Greeks abandoned Thebes. They just said, screw you, you're no longer within the defensive... The yeah. Athenian League. Oh, yeah, the defensive yeah, wall. The Hellenic uh, defense, yeah. And that, and there is no common Greek cause yet. That's no. something that grew out of the Persian Wars. Yeah. So, um, historians that would later come in, into an era where the, this kind of Greek commonality is recognized are criticizing Thebans for betraying uh, a philosophy that did not yet exist. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh... We can't retroproject nationalism yeah. Yeah, into that's, history. Yeah, that's a lot of the But Herodotus the does, yeah. Yeah. and later Greeks do. Uh, but I mean, our contemporary yeah. 20th century nationalism It was everyone especially. for themselves towards a certain goal, not everyone towards a certain goal together. Right. Um, a great example, the Peloponnesian War. Uh, yeah. Cor Corinth um, pushed uh, Sparta to fight against the Athenians, and after that very costly war for everyone, the Corinthians, with a now weakened uh, Athens, just turned on Sparta. Mm. They only were friends so long as their interests were the same. There was no common yeah. fraternity or brotherhood. Or There's no such thing as altruism. They don't do it for the sake of doing it, they do it because there's something in it. Or some, yeah, out of some common yeah. recognition of or bond. So, uh... We come to the Battle of Thermopylae, 480. Uh, the Persians are in Greece. Uh, the Athenians and the Spartans are up in charge of the armies. The Spartans, more specifically, uh, were in charge. And they decide that their best chance of at least delaying the army... I don't think they had any illusions about whether or not they were going to survive the assault. Uh, they knew they were going to die there. Uh, but... They wanted to slow them down, at least give the southern Greeks time to regroup and maybe put up another offensive. Um, so they sent the Spartans, the famous 300 Spartans, plus around, you know, 6,500 other Greeks, <laughs> went to the past of Thermopylae. Yeah, people ignore those. Uh, yeah, they're often ignored, probably because of the They're not culture. Uh, 
Uh, There's no. one group we're going to talk about here. Well, that's that's funny because it leads to uh, well the famous line from 300 too is what's your profession and that that's a line that oh totally yeah that definitely happened because the Spartans were all they were potters and career. carpenters as well. Well, the Spartans were career soldiers. They used um, the perioikoi and uh, their helots to do yeah. all the manual labor. They were professional trained. They trained and lived as soldiers, and that's all they did. But didn't they also partake after the certain age? Um, it, they they went into regular professions. Um, I don't think they did. Uh, yeah. I could be wrong. I'm not. I'm not a Spartan historian. We don't really actually know much about their culture um, either. Um, well, so they didn't write anything down. <laughs> very, very little. Yeah, this, the Spartans actually. Uh, so their training regiment comes from um, what's his name. Oh, the Lycurgus? Now, yeah, Lycurgus. That, yeah, he's, so a, the myth, he's a Romulus figure, though. The, the mythical <laughs> Lycurgus, the lawgiver. Yeah. Uh, Spartan is equivalent of Ath- Athens Solon and the Wolf of Moses. Uh, yeah, it, just that, that trope again. Solon's Part actually like, historical, though. We don't yeah. actually know. Um. Lycurgus uh, instituted, most importantly, um, the, oh, the, the uh, Agoge. The Agoge. Agoge. Oh, so Lycurgus yeah. was uh, directly responsible according to the Spartans, for the institution of the Agoge, uh, the training regiment that all Spartan children started, all Spartan male children, I should say, started at eight, uh, which they would graduate from, quote-unquote, from around the age of 30. Yeah. Um, so they would go through several tra- stages of training uh, where they would be more or less taught to lie, fight, uh, just take aim, forage, uh, eat shitty food, uh, live in the Sicidia, the mess halls. Um, the shitty food. Murder helots. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's uh, the Cryptea, one of the more interesting institutions that they would be involved one in. One of the more sick and twisted Yeah, well, I mean, Sparta... It's institutionalized terrorism. Largely, largely, largely outnumbered by itself. their slave yeah. population. Well. Um, <laughs> going back in Spartan history, they conquered uh, Messenia and took everyone there as a slave. Yeah, we've covered all so, of this yeah. fairly extensively. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have the Cryptea, then they move on to uh, being Ephebe... Uh, and then into adulthood and so on and so forth, and then eventually they'd be able to get position, uh, be able to run to be um, uh, the F4, uh, one of the five F4s, that sort of thing. Uh, Where was I again? (laughs) So, Um, uh, we were talking about how once the Greeks start getting a taste for, let's say, power as, as... as a unified army, army that can yeah. repel the Persians, and the Persians are <laughs> trotting through. So, so we're back at Thermopylae then. So, uh, With so we have sixty five hundred other Greeks. We have about right. seven thousand Greeks at Thermopylae. Right. The, the Greek, yes, yeah, <laughs> sixty five hundred. Uh, oh right. Yeah. So we have about seven thousand Greeks sitting at Thermopylae, waiting for this Persian force. So I, I was talking about earlier. Um, Bradford, the story of Bradford has a book in which he cites a British military leader uh, who estimates that a Persian force would probably be around 120,000 to 200,000 based on available resources, water resources. Uh, of course, Herodotus says three and a half million. Right. Uh, drank the rivers dry. Greece, not exactly known for its big rivers. So. Right. Uh, <laughs> the wide flowing Eurotas. <laughs> um, so it's we have great trickle. Either way, this huge force of Persians, and I mean, one hundred twenty thousand still is insane for the ancient world. Like um, it, it was insane f- for the early modern world. Yeah, yeah anywhere really. <laughs> I mean, World War One, probably the closest comparable conflict with that many troops in it. Maybe the Civil War was. Yeah, Civil War. Civil War, yeah. Um, at one battle, though... Um, but, we're, yeah, we're saying very, very late, like thousands of years later right. before you see comparable forces. Well, um, yeah. The, yeah, the Romans... Roman conflicts that... Romans would had raise that. Massive many, yeah. losses. Uh, yeah, the uh, Battle of Cannae, for example. Yeah, The greatest yeah, yeah. single loss until the Battle of the Somme or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we hit a point where the Persians come to the pass. Uh, we have the famous three-day fight in which... We, Every... We have... Firstly, uh, Mount Calidromos, which is the mountain that um, Thermopylae is butted up against, and the sea on the other side. Today, the sea line is much, much lower, so it's just kind and of... And there's a highway going through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, shall not pass. <laughs> so, 
Kaladromos is a beautiful running path. Uh, the Greeks all knew that there were multiple ways to get through, but you kind of bank on the idea that they'll take the largest path, which is the pass at Thermopylae, the hot gates. Uh, but they're betrayed by Ephialtes, uh, a the, salient, the salient goat herder, who says, yeah, just go this way. Um, and this is the funny thing. This is where I'm going to interrupt. Because first, they're betrayed by a Thessalian. Yeah. They, he's, the Thessalians have already chosen their side. This is not a betrayal. He's doing the civic duty of helping the person to whom they have sworn some fealty. Mm. And second, as Bob Porter once again mentions, the Greeks are hoplite fighters. Mm-hmm. They fight in open areas with heavy armor. The Persians come from a mountainous area, and they have light infantry. Absolutely. There's no way they would not have thought to walk around a yeah. mountain on their own. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, the main pass by which the Persians the are in Persia. Able... Exactly. They are not. They're. They are not going to fight in a, in a narrow, open pass for a and not even think to fight the way that they have learned to fight. Right. So, uh, well, the main pass by which the Persian immortals circumvent the, the per- Thermopylae, uh, the Greeks know about as well. They fully expected something, so they did, Leonidas did have a uh, force of Phocians. Thespians. No, no Phocians. Oh, the Phocians fled, yes. The Phocians Thespians on did. the pass. Uh, unfortunately, the immortals came in the night and murdered the Phocians while they Those slept. Those cowards. But at this point, uh, Leonidas knew that the Persians had found the pass, that they were coming... Uh, he sent all the other Greeks back. Uh, the only Greeks who stayed with them were about 900 thespians. I thought 700. 700. It's a few hundred thespians. Um, this is, again, another point that I yeah. love to bring up Bob Porter here. Because he um, he looks at the little guy in history, not just the great man. And this is a good example of... The, the Spartans at this point had like 10,000 citizen body. They lose 300 of it. This is a sad day for them. But the Phocians, uh, being a small city and losing 700, probably That's lost an enti- entire male population. The Thespians, Thespians. Thespians probably lost their entire male population capable of bearing arms. Yeah. And nobody really talks about their sacrifice at Thermopylae. Yeah, of course not. You see the, the romanticizing <laughs> of what Leonidas and those 300 extra Spartans as bodyguard were doing. You know, it, it's less if there are other Greeks there, I think, in... I know, but there are 700 of these poor thespians. <laughs> yeah. The flower of a generation just snuffed out. <laughs> yeah. And this so, big city loses a platoon. <laughs> so, at the end, um, all 1,000 of the remainders in Thermopylae... <laughs> Dad's <laughs> king. Yeah. It's one king. One yeah. of its two kings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't really just talk about that at 300. They still have another king. Yeah, that's, that's up to the king. Well, the senior king. Yeah. <laughs> I, Leonidas is Not actually, the king of kings. <laughs> Leonidas actually interests me because he's one of the few Spartan kings in all of Sparta's history who went through the Agoge. Uh, Spartan kings did not go through the Agoge. Uh, he came to the throne because of actually a murder, the murder of his father, I believe, or his uncle. Uh, it's very complicated. He came to the throne slightly after Marathon. Um, he was never supposed to be king. So he had been through the military training, as every second and third son of a Spartan king would. Oh, so he never really learned that his life is more valuable. Than <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Leo Tikhonides. Leo Tikhonides. And he the paid the price for it. <laughs> yeah. So still, uh, king. still <laughs> king. The most famous Spartan king. They're still queen. Yeah. There will soon be a king. <laughs> Um, Gotta go. Doesn't I'll cut go that through. In. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on which lists you don't want to be on, or which ones you think you're already on. I'm already on a lot of lists, I imagine. <laughs> there will be a king, unless I have something to say about it. <laughs> I'm gonna get arrested. Hopefully, a federal pres- prison. They have better health care institutions. <laughs> yeah, this is like country club prison. I think treason's. Pr- uh, yeah. Yeah, I treason. Just, yeah, well, that is still a thing. Yeah, I, I think like I don't want one of them provincial prisons. They, I mean, I get out sooner, but I have nothing really on the outside, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, better health care. Um, help me deal with the stress of being unjustly imprisoned by the crown. I'll take up an interest in Irish music. Three meals um, a day. <laughs> yeah, three three free meals. Yeah, they, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Sorry, just a little food for thought. 
So <laughs> that so, would actually uh, be food for thought. If <laughs> my opinions got me arrested. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be more food than I got doing this. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no rent. Kill the queen. <laughs> uh, You're debating on what to cut now. <laughs> uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, um, they're monopolized a bust. Uh, Right. But it falls through. Like like I said, they didn't plan to carry it on for years and years and repel the huge Persian army, but uh, you know, after three days they fell apart. And this is important because uh, nearby, just off of Eubea, is the Battle of Artemisium, which is happens in tandem by design. Um, so the Greek ships are going at it with the Persian ships. Um, the Persians had lost a good number of ships earlier, crashed in the Eubea because of a huge storm. Um, so they've lost a decent part of their navy, uh, but as soon as the Greeks hear that Leonidas is dead, Thermopylae has failed, they sail back, uh, they get out of there, and the Persians have access in southern Greece. Uh, they, they take Boeotia, um, Cadmia is taken, uh, Thebes, uh, and they move south towards Attica, uh, at which point the Athenians uh, are abandoning ship, uh, metaphorically, to the ships. Uh, <laughs> God damn it, Mitch. <laughs> and uh, they're sailing to Salamis uh, right across the bay. Uh, Salamis is not a huge island. I've seen it myself. Um, you can see it from the coast um, through the straits. Um, I have an anecdote about Salamis. <laughs> when I was TAing and I was marking papers, one of the questions in the short answer questions was Salamis. And I had at least five to ten students in a class of a hundred write delicious sandwich meats. <laughs> salamis, yeah. I like salami. I had salamis earlier. It's true. I hate salami. I failed them all. <laughs> well, you should have, but I disagree with you on the salami point, Dan. Delicious, chewy, spicy. It's just not for me. That's fine. No, I like like. Every other sandwich meat, but salami? Bologna. Oh, uh, bologna's nasty. Summer sausage yeah, okay. is my joint. Kabasa, I, th- I find, is too moist. I like yeah, some... too chewy, too rubbery. Yeah, yeah I... it's not a sandwich meat. It's no. more of like a... It's a like cheese a and cracker, 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 cracker meat. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cracker meat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have that with like a Triscuit and some brie? Yo. Oh, damn. If, if we have time after this... <laughs> <laughs> There will never be any time for Triscuits. <laughs> I say good day to you. <laughs> so, these battles are happening in tandem. In tandem. And then we have the uh, Battle of Battle Salamis. Battle of Salamis. So, the Athenians have abandoned their city. They've gone to Salamis and sat in their fleet in the straits. Uh, Athens is taken. Uh, there is... Not all of the Athenians leave Athens. Some stay on the Acropolis and hold out. Uh, but they don't last long. Obviously, the Persians climb the cliffs... Uh, get in there and stab them to death. Uh, and then they burn Athens. They they raise the entire city. The Acropolis is destroyed, right. which is really important later for Pericles. Yeah, uh, this would... Opens a huge opportunity. Yeah. Real estate market. It's, yeah. it, you won't see another big opening until the, you know, the uh, flip, great fire of Rome under Nero's mm-hmm. rule. Nothing better for real estate than just, you know, some underbrush being burned Yeah. Down. I mean, the Acropolis is you kind of... You don't even need to gentrify it anymore. <laughs> yeah, you burnt the homeless. <laughs> the Acropolis is really... It's one of those hot spots, right? When I was there, there's a, a Nazi pillbox on it. What? Still at the back, yeah. There's, really? Yeah. They haven't taken it out? No, it's still there. There's no effort to, like, restore... Nope. No? It's, uh, well, there's, it's there, there a historical was, site, I mean. It's a historical site, yeah. So there's, and like, I mean, the Erechtheon and then, like... The Erechtheon, the, Nazi Nazi uh, the Parthenon, <laughs> the, the Propylia, and then... And then at the very back, so the far side, there's a huge Greek flag up on it, but it's like a platform of viewing platform. Of course, there, of course there is. And then uh, just the bunker. But they don't want to acknowledge that currently the Greek flag is owned by the Germans. Is, is, yeah, <laughs> is that where the Golden Dawn hang out? Maybe. The Acropolis, it's not even the highest point in the city. I don't know if you know that. There's another hill uh, you can see directly across. It's actually higher. Uh, probably not as flat, though. 
Um, just not as well defensible. No, probably not. I would say it's a little farther away from the Piraeus, too. It's the opposite direction, if I remember right. So, um, yeah. Piraeus is the port city. The port city, yeah. So um, It's like Athens is Ostia. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't remember exactly why they decided to uh, take the hill they did as the Acropolis. Probably because of the flatness. Uh, the Acropolis is actually quite large. Like, Where is it? Uh, the other one, geographically, further from water? Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's further from the Piraeus. Okay, um, so it probably was just... Um, it is significant. Like it's, it's noticeably taller. Even standing on the Acropolis, you have to look up slightly. Well, I mean, when you're... It's, it's a mile or so away, but... The Acropolis is probably then just because it's it was closer to the water when they founded a little settlement. And well, the other thing with the Acropolis too, you have to remember, is that it, it's the mythological site for the contest between Athena and Poseidon. Well, yeah, I'm just thinking that the Acropolis would have become just out of habit since yeah. its early foundation, the defensive point. Yeah, and I mean the Acropolis itself is surrounded by like cult shrines and like little caves in the mountain are huge deals. Yeah. Uh, and in the swamps. I, yeah, I don't know a huge amount about them, but... Uh, yeah, that's where the Anthesteria happens. Yeah, it's just one of those places. So, I mean, I, I mean, there's probably a decent number of reasons, but it is, it's much bigger than I ever thought it would be. Just picturing the Acropolis, I mean, you see the temple, and like, all right, they're pretty big, but then you get there, and you look out, and it's, it's massive. Um, and all marble, too. Slippery as hell to walk on. Because it's so worn, especially the That's steps. That's how they got rid of their old... The steps, yeah. The steps going up to the Acropolis are super dangerous. <laughs> no Senate can be too senate <laughs> Too much crust. There's, right there was off. more of a youth ideal among the Greeks, and you could see it in the use of marble steps. <laughs> <laughs> the lack of slippery wet wet signs. <laughs> yeah. The Romans, they, they knew what it was up. They did some It was a little grittier. Old Cato could, you know, keep his step. Walking stick. Those were prohibited in ancient Greece. <laughs> Once you fall, you die where you're you lay. Yeah, so awesome. the Persians dominate Athens. It's gone. They don't care for it. They hate the Athenians. They kill everyone who's there and they burn the rest to the ground. Um, Since we've been off topic for so long, it's worth re re just reminding that very few are left there. Yeah, very few. I, the very few people uh, who f feel so strongly. Uh, about the temples on the Acropolis, about the city itself, they're not willing to abandon Athens. They barricade themselves on the Acropolis with the decided plan to defend it from the Persians, who they know are coming, because they know we're going to take the city because there's no one left. So they die, and the Persians uh, go looking for the Athenians, obviously, because they wanted to kill the Athenians, not just destroy Athens. So uh, the Athenians, women and children, non-combatants, safe on Salamis, and the fleet sitting in the strait, uh, so the Persian plan now comes down to sailing a Persian fleet of, as I mentioned before, Phoenician vessels into these straits to uh, try and defeat this army. You can imagine Xerxes sitting on his nice throne on the cliffs above, uh, watching this battle unfold as these slow, lumbering Phoenician galleys are fighting these quick, fast, three-row triremes, which are meant to ram. Uh, triremes have a large brass, wow, yeah. Yeah, brass prow, that they essentially use as a, a water-based battering ram to sink other ships, and that's uh, that was their strategy. Uh, so these, these Athenian ships, which are fast and agile, completely destroy the Persian fleet. Uh, yeah, this was like Thermopylae on water. Yeah, Thermopylae on water, except uh, the Greeks are victorious this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at which point, um, the, uh, the Persians have no choice but to flee. They're being beaten badly. Xerxes goes back to Persia, and he takes the rest of uh, a large part of his army and fleet with him. And uh, he leaves Mardonius to stay in Greece and keep fighting the war. And this leads us to, almost an entire year later, the, the fighting season's over. Um, so the Persians retreat back north into Greece, where they have their allies, uh, the Thessalians and... Um, Are they, yeah, winter quarters. Thebans, it's, yeah. We don't often think about winter quarters in modern warfare, where... All right, uh, it's time to just retreat for the winter. No fighting can be done now. You've yeah. got seeds to plant, too. Yeah. yeah, you consider it the agriculture. I mean, I mean, obviously the Persians wouldn't be as concerned about that. Yeah, they have standing armies. Taking quarter in Greece, uh, taking resources from the northern Greeks, uh, not really their concern. Uh, but you obviously you can't fight in the winter still. It gets cold in Thrace. You don't want to maintain a siege. You don't want to maintain a siege, a prolonged action like that in enemy territory without definite supplies, without the ability to maneuver and move troops. Um, there's no point in maintaining a siege during the winter often, no. because uh, 
you, you maintain the siege during the war season, and what can they do in the well, winter? Well, and during the winter, too, the cities you're besieging would have a winter stock. Yeah. Which means they'd have the most resources of any time of the year. Yeah. So, yeah, you just starve them out during the summer, keep them from their harvest, yeah. and during the winter, if they still have some of the stock left, fine, you can eat that. You're not going to find anything out here, then we, we'll come back in the spring. I mean, even in modern warfare, look at something like Stalingrad. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, the winter turned back Napoleon, the winter turned back Hitler. Winter it's not a good time hasn't changed. Yeah. <laughs> War hasn't changed. It hasn't. Well, it's gotten more explosive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's gotten a little it's bit more... more uh, nuclear. Ranged. Yeah, it's got varied. Very varied. War is very impersonal now. Can be. Yeah. Five, I mean, sometimes it people... It any other way, right? Depends on, you know, how the person's waging it. Are they lobbing a missile, or are they the missile? I mean, you look at a modern army. Like, any modern army, it's it's an impersonal war. You fight from oh, flying oh, crafts. Oh. Large, no, an advanced modern army. Very recently. Yeah. Yeah, and even then, I wouldn't say all modern armies. I'd just say the best modern <laughs> armies. The one going around the shooting one up who's... goat herders. How oh, guns, missiles... Planes, Guns, yeah, but... I mean, you, an artillery barrage is just as likely as stabbing someone in the face with a knife. And I mean, most modern armies aren't even equipped with close-range weapons anymore. Not not in the, uh, yeah, the like melee hand sense. Hand. Like, you might have a closer-range projectile weapon, but I mean, you're, you're still not looking at stabbing very many people in your no, lifetime. They don't even use really handguns because they're not far enough well, range. I, I know, they're a, the, it's called a sidearm because... You know, it's, it's like the last thing. I mean, it's here if you need it, but, I mean, you've got a fully automatic assault rifle for a reason. That's usually enough. Yeah. Well, for your opponents, perhaps. <laughs> Brett only fights his inner demons. Yeah. Interdimensional rocket launchers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we know. So, Salamis, Salamis has been won. He, Salamis has been won by the Greeks, and Mardone this... is taking winter quarters. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, following that winter, coming back into the campaign season, Mardoni has moved south into Greece again, and uh, this is where he ends up at Plataea, backed in, actually, uh, which kind of goads the Greek forces out. Uh, I, I do like one, the episode of the Envoy to, Ath to the Athenians. Oh, uh, yeah, you go ahead. Uh, when the Ath Athenians are still on Salamis, Mardoni has sent an, uh, a Theban envoy, I believe it was, was it not? Uh, yeah, I think he was Stephen. A Theban envoy to negotiate peace. Um, in the Greek, in the Athenian boule, uh, the envoy was heard, and uh, and one Athenian championed the cause of suing for a somewhat humbling peace. The envoy was sent away from the city, escorted out, I mean, from Salamis, put on his boat, and told, no, this, we're not accepting these terms. The Athenian who advocated this same course of action was stoned along with his family. <laughs> and I just like, I, it's that idea of proper action. Herodotus does not pass any judgment on this. The, the, you know, this was an envoy. You can't hurt him. He, he's just a messenger. This guy is advocating bes betraying the city. Compare this with the episode in 300 uh, the, where... Leonidas kicks the uh, this Persian envoy down a well. Uh, this is celebrated in the film, but this is seen as a horrible act of hubris by the ancients, that you would violate an envoy who comes, uh, not in violence, but just to talk terms. This is violating Zeus Xenia, mm -hmm. the idea that Zeus provides protection to these strangers. Um, this is often attribute the reason attributed as the reason why Xerxes beheaded the body of Le uh, Leonidas uh, after the Battle of 300 as a uh, revenge against his act of, of hubris against the messengers. And I just like the uh, kind of Athenian approach. This, this is a Herodotian, but we don't know how much we can trust, but I just like the two various stories about how you treat a messenger. So Mardonius is marched south. Um... So over this winter, while Mardonius was taking quarters in Thessaly, uh, all the Greek allies were kind of, kind of squabbling because they had to decide where to make their next defensive stand in a war that 
they didn't exactly perceive was going as they wished. Uh, after all, Athens had been burned, uh, the Athenians had lost their city altogether, and although they won a battle, uh, they had no long-term plan. Uh, the Spartans wanted to build a defense at the Isthmus, uh, where Corinth is, uh, another narrow patch of land where the Persians would have to uh, narrow themselves down a little, at least there'd be a more uh, controlled area than an open field. Uh, but obviously everyone north of the Isthmus was very much against this plan because it completely disincluded them in the defense and submitted their cities to being destroyed by Persian forces. Uh, but eventually they started to march north. Uh, the Persian army, or the, uh, sorry, Greek armies, uh, under the command of the regent Pausanias, uh, who took over after Leonidas was dead. Uh, not a king himself, but... I do like the one thing about the, uh, the Spartans setting out. That they did it at night. That's just a, a course of habit. Spartan uh, force always deploys at night because... Spies are less likely to see it, and it's going. The word will not travel. It's just such a very interesting custom for them to have. So uh, the Greeks are marching north, and as I said, Mardonius is coming south. Uh, he decides his best course of action is to set himself down near the Greek city of Plataea, a small town, back against the mountains. Um, not much going on there, uh, with the Plataeans obviously worried. Uh, they threatened to defect if they didn't get help. Um, so the Spartans, the Athenians, all the Greeks remaining free still marched to Plataea, uh, where they mustered a pretty large force, and uh, they pulled down the Persians. They killed Mardonius, uh, which was effectively the end of the invasion uh, into Greece by the Persians. Um, I used to say Mardonius was really, really the vestiges of command that was left behind, and once he was killed on the battlefield, uh, the Persians tried to protect his body. They weren't so great at it, though, and the Greeks got a hold of it. Uh, the Greeks took all the Persian army out. Uh, this is where Pausanias is noted for, uh, well, his, his supposed greed at entering Mardonius' command tent, where he sees the feast and the gold, um, then he kind of takes it as his own. And, and obviously Spartans, they, I mean, we have the word Spartan for a reason, it's bare. Uh, they didn't own any things themselves, they, they didn't have money, they didn't need it. They had these giant, they, like, iron ingots or something. Yeah, that's how they traded they it. They had long, oiled hair. Yeah, no beards. No beards. beards. is bad. Right. Right. You're clean shaven. That, that, that's, a, that's a hygiene issue if you're on expedition. That Absolutely. Makes sense. There was um, also a tradition in, in Greek culture of supplicating uh, mercy by holding on to someone's beard. Yeah. I wonder if that plays into it. Like, no one right. can supplicate you for mercy because you don't have a beard. <laughs> I, I thought it was a uh, knee. You grab the yeah, you grab the yeah. knee, you grab behind the knee with one hand, and, and then you the, grab the beard uh, with the okay. other, and yeah. then you command their attention. I see. Yeah, so, I mean, Pausanias... Uh, I don't remember his exact story, but it doesn't go too well for him. I think he has to retreat into the mountains. He ends up becomes a, becoming like a tyrant in yeah. um, Byzantium, and then uh, he flees east or something. Yeah, more or less, the moral of Pausanias' story is don't be a greedy Spartan. I, I did like the care. story of entering the Persian camp, that the Persians yeah. came all this way to rob us of our po poverty. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that's a good Spartan the laconic I, wit. The less I have, the more I gain. So, uh, uh, I mean, basically coming to the end of the Persian invasion, um, it wasn't the end of the war by any means. The, the Greeks themselves set out in counterattacks uh, with the Battle of Mycale in 479. Yeah, the Athenians uh, liberated. Yeah, the Athenians liberating Mycale. Liberated. Um, well, they they were liberated. I, I don't know when the um, the Delian League became despotic, but I'd say uh, it was not long after. By the time, well, obviously, once you get to um, the Periclean restoration projects, uh, oh yeah, treasury is being fully used. I was to I was thinking like within a couple but decades. Yeah, it, it's not long after, and I mean that's that all starts at about four forty six. Uh, so, I mean, you're looking at. A, a decade or two after uh, the formation of the Peloponnesian, the Delian Leagues, really coming to fruition, uh, and then leading down towards 430 when the Peloponnesian War gets going. So, yeah. but yeah, they did they did liberate um, the Athenians, and I mean the Athenians did liberate the Ionians, and the Spartans were part of this. Yeah, um, it's really the Spartans 
were of a different mindset than they were come the time they formed the Peloponnesian League, because they were, were just washing their hands of this. They've done yeah. their part. They did not want to be bothered with with these across the sea matters. They did. They just. They might have been able to claim a leadership role. It, uh, they were still more powerful than Athens at this time. They yeah. didn't have a navy to do it. No navy. Yeah, the Spartans didn't well, they develop could have... a navy until... Yeah, they could have enslaved Lincoln. another polis and taken their navy. Yeah. But, I mean, like, you look at it that way, it, it always comes off more so as the Peloponnesian League wasn't so much a league to an alliance as a league to... It was a response. ...be an antithesis to... Yeah, it was the a Athenian, Delian League, yeah. which was huge and far-reaching. It was a reaction to um, uh, the encroachments of Athens, and, which were to be feared. And with, like, a direct result of such a large Athenian navy is that they're now controlling all this land not part of the mainland. I mean, before they had relations, obviously, with everything, but now they were more or less in control of... All yeah, the ma- the major great trade routes, routes into the Black Sea, into the Black sea uh, yeah. not so much towards Sicily yet. I mean, the Sicilian expedition is a whole other thing. But <laughs> um, so let's talk uh, b- because the Delian League is fairly important. Yeah, uh, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So what what happens? Let's say at the tail end of this war with with the Persians. I uh, so they've basically gone across the Aegean, fought, and it, it all comes to a peace. Um, well, I, I mean, we don't know for sure, but we know that uh, at some point during the following few years, uh, after the campaigns, the counter-campaigns against Persia that the Greeks made, uh, they came to a peace agreement. Um, we don't know if it was a formal agreement or just an understanding yeah, just not an to understanding. pass a body of um, water. Yeah, I mean... You, I forget what... They it's a body of water in Anatolia. Yeah, the, for the most part, there was an understanding that this so, they would not transgress this line. Plutarch suggests that the aftermath of the area of Eurymedon, or next Xerxes had agreed a peace treaty with the Greeks. Um, yeah, Plutarch is not reliable. In yeah, any way. Plutarch's not reliable. Uh, Much later, he attributes like th- third century this reforms to like Hergus, for example. Oh, really? Peace yeah. of Callias. Does that ring anybody's bell? Could be Callias. Well, yeah, in any case, I mean, we see, essentially, it's re- resolved by a, a peace of some sort, whether official or unofficial, things cool down, uh, and obviously the Greeks start to look introspectively towards what empires, what connections they've already built, uh, and that's where you get the, the Delian League and the Peloponnesian League, and then eventually the Peloponnesian Wars. Right, so the Delian League is a confederation that was, you know... Headed. Let's say loosely a confederate. Er, 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 <laughs> it was it was a hegemony. Is, yeah, I think is the term that's most of often, Athens, um, based around the island of Delos, which was uh, uh, the Trinity. site of an oracle. It, this is the site where Apollo was With believed born. to have been born, yeah. um, and it was the omphalos, the navel of the world. Delphi. Yeah. No, no I mean there are many world navels, yeah. but okay. the the omphalos, but the omphalos stone is uh, it's at Delphi. Yeah. Or, yeah it's no, it's Delphi. at Delos. I, I saw it myself. Oh, you Delphi, did. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. See. I got it. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they have a fake one sitting. Is it an right? Audi? They have a fake one sitting right beside. It looks like an egg. Like it's an egg with like it's flowers. An uh, it's not an Amy. They have a fake one sitting beside the treasury of the Athenians at uh, Delphi, and then the, the real ones inside the museum there. Basically, they chose Delos because it was a neutral sanctuary island. Uh, like really, um, you go there. It's a windy place. Um, it was the hub of the slave trade in the ancient. It was the hub, uh, and I mean, it, it's important for as long as it's an island. Uh, right into the Hellenistic period. I mean, the huge. There's this huge. Up to the Mithridatic Wars. Uh, donated by Philip the Fifth. Yeah, the stone of Philip the Fifth. I mean, it's obviously all in ruins now. But I mean, the, there's nothing there. There's no resources there worth taking. It was purely an island of sanctuary and worship, and it was completely neutral. It was neutral grounds. So that's why the it's treasury. It's even mentioned in Homer. Yeah. Yeah, um, the treasury wasn't there for long, though. No, the treasury wasn't there, but that's the initial idea. It's why it was there. It was a neutral. Right. It was, it was neutral the Washington D.C. where yeah. basically <laughs> yeah. a money laundering. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, where the Athenians say, "All right, well, I mean, we don't own this. Keep your money here." 
And then eventually they pulled the snafu and said, nah, we just took it. Wasn't that after the failure of the Egyptian campaign? Um... Or I believe the that moving was, of the treasury. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it had where to they do failed with against. Anything. So Naxos withdraws uh, from the Delian League. Uh, you mean Milos? No, no Naxos. Naxos. Okay. Uh, they withdraw, and Athens says, "No, no, no, you are not withdrawing from this league." Yeah. And here is where I would say we get the birth of the Athenian Empire. Yeah. In a, in a de facto sense. Yeah. Yeah. When someone challenges this kind of consensus, um, this idea of consensus happens. No, it's not about yeah. consent. It's you're uh, here and we're not letting you go. They built their empire on the back of the Persian conflict. And once they had the power, they wouldn't let go. I mean, I mean, why would they? They, they controlled so much now. They were more powerful than any other city-state or alliance there was in the Greek world at that time. And I mean, the Persian Empire was by no means gone. They they come up again and again, especially during the end of the Peloponnesian War, where they sided with the Spartans. But, um, I mean, you see Athens go from a pretty big city-state. I mean, nothing to balk at, but uh, the city's destroyed, and then once again, they're in charge of basically everything that's relevant in the Greek world through conquest, through economic sanctions. Um, they they have the money, they have the yeah. ships. I mean, and this is the, the beginning of Athens' golden age yeah. of, of uh, the tragedians, um, architecture, philosophy, yeah. architecture. The, the, the famous, this is where the famous Athens, it comes out of all this. Yeah, right. it's from exploiting their right. neighbors. Yeah. Right. As, as is usually the case <laughs> as of, is tradition. Uh, of as golden is tradition, ages. Yeah. Such is life. <laughs> Such is life. <laughs>